we find in Philippians. Is there any encouragement from being united with Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Philippians. Thank you, Miriam. Hi. Good morning. It's so good to see you all today. I don't feel like we can clap enough. That's fantastic news. That's pretty cool. Uh, can we give a clap to um, Shane and Maureen and Kim, who mainly did that? Yes, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. We've been talking about that for a couple of weeks, and if you missed that, that's okay. You're here today. That's a theme we're going to be holding on to for a little while here, community. And right, I love, I don't know if you can tell from out there, the, the calm and the unity, being a little bit different colors, right? So that, that stands out, the unity in community that we are going to be talking about today in the scripture from Ephesians and that we've been talking about for a while. We're going to be focusing on what it is to live in community with other believers, with everybody in this room. Isn't that cool? There are some people missing, but in general, this is Redeemer, right? We are here. Another, come on. <laughs> Can't do it too much. It's great. We're picking up this week where we left off last week. Last week we were in Ephesians 4 and ended up only covering the first verse. Uh, verse 1, and what it is to walk in a worthy way. But before I get to the recap, I want to read this passage again. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. Father, I pray for this message this morning, this passage from Ephesians that Paul wrote to us 2,000 years ago, that you would use it to move our hearts and transform it into the likeness of your Son, that you would be doing what is the hard and unpleasant work of tilling up the soil of our souls, Lord. That you plant the seeds to make us more like Christ. In your name we pray, amen. So last week we did look at verse 1, what it means to walk in a worthy manner of our calling. As those who have been called by Christ, our every desire should be to walk in a worthy way, in lowliness, humility, and meekness, gentleness with fellow believers. That was our main thrust kind of of our passage last week. And we learned that our calling is a literal calling. We were called by Christ from death into life. That we're not called into a legalistic obedience but to walk worthily out of our relationship with Christ. And we can only hope to walk a worthy life if our focus is on the gospel. It must be at the center of every facet of our being. So, that was last week, old news, right? This week, how do we live that out? What does it look like 
to live and walk a worthy life. In the next few verses, 2 and 3 and 4, Paul gives us six characteristics to look at. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, those six characteristics. So today, kind of the thrust of this passage is pretty simple. (laughs) To walk a worthy life, we should have lowliness, which is humility, meekness, which is gentleness, patience, love, unity, and peace. The six things that Paul lists there. Is there anybody here uh, that has maybe learned to drive within the last year or is planning to learn to drive within the next little bit? Yeah, be proud. Do it. Yes. I I count four, and some of you terrify me. So you're going to be great. You're going to be all confidence to you. So uh, I was driving my daughter Hattie home from school just this past week, and I was so happy when this happened because I was like, there's my sermon illustration. Perfect. And she's in the back seat, and she says, Daddy, how do you make the car go? So I'd say, well, there's a pedal to make it uh, go faster. And she says, how do you make it stop? Well, there's a pedal to make it break. Well, how do you turn the car? Well, you see me turn the wheel, and we turn that, and that makes it turn. Well, how do you know where to drive on the road? Well, I learned the why, right? Anybody have kids? Why, why, why? Or how? We learn the rules of the road, right? We learn what side of the road is okay to drive on and what side is not okay to drive on. Well, how do you not hit other cars? Well, you, you pay attention and you, you um, keep track of where other cars are, right? I did not say this next part. The single best piece of advice I've ever gotten was from my cousin who said, when I was learning how to drive, drive like everybody else is an idiot. <laughs> That'll keep you going. So, don't worry, I didn't say this in my done. So, right? All these things, how do you do this? How do you do this while you drive? And then, her concluding statement, Daddy, that is a lot of stuff. You are amazing. <laughs> we did it! It's the words every parent longs to hear. She said, how do you learn to do all those things? Right, with practice and with intentionality, focusing on them. And so it is with the six things that Paul outlines here. These things all build on each other. So while unity of the spirit and the bond of peace is the goal, that can't hope to happen without true love for one another. And bearing one another in love can't hope to happen if we don't have enduring patience with one another. And at the root of having patience with one another is having a heart of humility and gentleness, which was the heart of our Savior. And really, humility is the gas, right? You can learn all these things about the road, how not to hit cars, where to drive, how to use the brake, how to turn. But if you don't press the gas, none of it matters, right? And so it is with humility. And so actually, we're going to be spending the camping out in humility for most of our time today um, because it is the heart of our Savior. Humility is at the center of who Christ is. It's the first domino for all these characteristics in this passage. Without humility, nothing else can happen. Because without humility, you are the most important person in the community. You are elevated. Because the opposite of humility is pride. Pride is putting yourself first, your own needs first, your own interests first, your own desires first. You know who never did that? Yeah, Sunday school answer, bring it on. Yeah. That's exactly right. Jesus. This was the heart of Jesus, humility. That's why I had Miriam read that passage, and I'm going to read part of it again, because this is one of the most important passages for us in all of Scripture, which is a bold statement, because this is one of the most important things in all of Scripture for us to get, as the heart of Christ is humility. I'm going to read it again in Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant 
being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came to exhibit what it is to see others as more important. To focus on their lives instead of his own. To take on their problems and needs even at the cost of his own. In the depths of his heart, Jesus was gentle and lowly. There's only one real place in the gospel where Jesus lets us into his very heart. It's in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Such an interesting way to say that in Jesus as he always did, knew exactly what he was doing, and used things from that day, right? A yoke. I think most of us, especially if you've been in church a long time, you know this, or maybe you are familiar with agriculture. Anybody grow up on a farm? A yoke, right? Does what? Hitches two oxen together to plow the field, right? A yoke is an instrument of burden. A yoke is an instrument that when people hear it, they don't think light and easy, right? They think burdensome and hard. So Jesus is taking this everyday life thing, as again he often did, and reframing it, transforming it into how the kingdom of God works and not the kingdom of this world. This yoke that the Pharisees place over you is hard. And right, the Pharisees had made it hard, developing rules and counter rules and extra subpoints and headers underneath God's original law to flesh out how it's supposed to look, which became a burden for the people. Right? Give most of your money to the temple. Give most of your time. Give, give your alms. Give everything. Follow these rules. Repent. Offer this sacrifice, this sacrifice taking the good law of God and distorting it into a heavy, heavy yoke. Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly, and you will find a rest for my souls. I don't know about you, but some weeks I need a rest for my soul. It's, it's a big, heavy time in life, and I need to remember that Jesus' yoke is easy, and his burden is light. In his book titled Gentle and Lowly, Author and theologian Dane Ortland says it this way, and if you, if you are looking for a new book to read, I recommend this book. If we are asked to say only one thing about who Jesus is, we would be honoring Jesus' own teaching if our answer is gentle and lowly. I think so, I, I don't know what you picture. I think so often in my mind, at least I used to and still struggle with it, I Picture often the, the, the Jesus who's flipping tables or who is teaching the crowds. But way more often, you see in Scripture that Jesus has compassion on people. People come up to him all the time, right? When he is tired and exhausted and wants to get away. And he's gentle and lowly of heart towards them. That is the defining characteristics, the first priorities of who our Savior is. Humility is a fundamental sense of yourself in relation to God and to others. Humility isn't trying to think of yourself less and less. It's trying to think about others more and more. Their needs, their interests, their concerns, their worries in life. It starts with how we view others. It starts with how we view others. Where do you hold others in relation to yourself? I'd like to invite my good friend, Mr. Chris Cass. There he is. He knew this was coming. Don't worry. Chris, come up. I just want you to stand, actually, just right there for a minute. And you just look at me. And um, how are you? Good. I'm, I'm good. Tell me about your week. Oh, yeah. Dude, my week was super busy. I can't even tell you all the things that happened to me this week, right? But yeah, I, th I would love to. Yeah, I mean, I had, like, sermons to get ready for, like, practicing music, um, kids to take care of, right? Just like 
Lots and lots of things. Anyway, anyway, yeah, back to you. Anything, anything you did? I hate taekwondo. Ta- my daughter wants to get into karate. Isn't that, that great? So I would love to see her like learn self-defense and all these things. I mean, I would just love it if she could like kick some boys, but you know, later in life. You know, I mean, pro- that's right. That's right. Chris, can you switch places with me? Come on up here. You're preaching now. All right. <laughs> so Wednesday we had a walk. <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? Good, tell me about your week. It was a good week. What'd you do? Uh, had Taekwondo on Tuesday, Awana on Wednesday. Great, who, do you, who takes Taekwondo? The whole family. Really? Really. I would love to see you do some Taekwondo. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> some other time. Okay. Good. Can we give a round of applause for Chris? <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Humility is about our fundamental view of someone else. And too often, I'm guilty of this in my own life. People are down there, and I'm up here. Way more excited to tell them about my life than to ask them about their life, their problems, their desires, what's going on with them. Pray for them. Christ calls us to flip that. He calls us to elevate others as he did. He wants to see, he wants us to see people the way that he did. With humility and compassion. Not thinking of our own concerns and vain conceit. In case you need more reasons uh, why we should be humbled, um, I'm about to give you seven, so... Uh, John Piper lists these out from him, and so we're going to walk through these and read some scripture, and you can fill in the notes in your bulletin. These are seven quality reasons, and there are more. If you ever forget, why should we have humility as our Christ did? Number one, our calling from death to life because of Christ rescued us from hopeless deadness. We were destined for deadness and could do nothing on our own if that isn't humbling. Ephesians 2.12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2.1-3, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Number two, our calling was at the price of Christ's blood, not our blood. Ephesians 2, 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Number three, our calling required supernatural power to give us life. Again, we were powerless to give ourselves life, to dig ourselves out of sin and reconcile with God. Ephesians 2, 5 through 9. But God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All the Awana people said with me, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. That's one of my favorite lines of any song that we sing. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Number four, our calling sustains us now, though we still fall short. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, so put off your old self, 
which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off our old self and put on the new self, which is clothed in Christ. Number five, our calling provides an inheritance of all things. <laughs> First Corinthians three twenty-one through twenty-three. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let no one boast in men or things of this world, for everything is yours in Christ. We are co-heirs. What do we have to boast about when we have eternity in front of us? Number six, our calling is because of the example of Christ's lowliness. And I should have made this one last and rearranged it, because I think this is the most important one. We are to be like Christ. And follow his example. Our calling is because of his example of loneliness. We're going to read this passage again because it's. Uh, are you getting a theme? I want this to stick in your minds. Philippians two five through eight. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human for me, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. We read this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Number seven, the final one here. Our calling makes clear <laughs> that we are not God, that we are under God. First Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Every day, we should be getting on our hands and knees. The physical act of that is humbling in and of itself and saying before God, I am not God. And you are God. Do you know something very interesting that I learned um, a while ago is, you know, why uh, it started, uh, why we fold hands while we pray. Like this. So we teach our kids. It stems back to medieval times. Isn't that cool? Who do that, right? And when you would come before a king, you would come and you would bow and you would clasp your hands like this. And what this symbolized was that you were submitting yourself to him entirely because you, in this position, could not draw your sword quickly to defend yourself. That you were saying to the king, I'm at your disposal. Do what you will with me. Isn't that cool? We humble ourselves before the king, the creator of the universe. Piper also gives this great definition of humility kind of long, so don't try to write it down, but I can send it to you, or you can, you can look it up. I'm going to read this for us. Humility means the person's heart is inclined to think little of himself, to suspect his own judgments, to regard his strength as small, and his sin as great. He is prone to give others the benefit of the doubt, and to be more taken up by their welfare than he is his own. He will not talk much of his own achievements because he regards them as small, except to glorify Christ. And he won't seek the limelight or yearn for men's approval or applause. In short, he is so overwhelmed by the greatness of his own sin and the immensity of God's mighty and holy hand over him that nothing seems more absurd to him that he would be self-assertive or self-confident or in any way enamored by his own distinctions or achievements. He has given up the futile craving of striving for vain glory. His great delight is to behold the mercy of God toward him in his weakness and ungodliness. His reward will be great 
because the last shall be first, and blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's important, humility. How do we achieve this, right? Humility isn't a choice. It's a gift of the Spirit. It is something the Spirit works on in your heart, just like sin, pride is not something we can get rid of on our own. We need the Spirit's help. So to get rid of pride and to enter into humility, we ask for it. You pray every day and say, Lord, give me a humble heart. Help me to see people the way that Christ saw people. It's elevated above himself. The great thing about it is, even if you don't want that, because change only happens when you want something more than you want to stay the same. But even if you don't want that, you can make those words come out and you can ask God. Give me a heart of Christ. Give me a heart of humility every day. Which brings us to meekness or gentleness. Meekness is also not man-made. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And to be clear, to rectify any misgivings or wrong thinkings we may have about the idea of meekness, meekness is not push overness, right? It is a quiet confidence, a confidence that you do indeed have the greatest and only hope for humankind, that you indeed are co-heirs with Christ in the inheritance that God has for us. Meek people are free from boasting because they don't need to boast. If you know in three days that you are going to inherit $10 million, I play this game all the time with my wife, and she hates it, but she, but she loves me more than she hates it, so she plays it with me. I say, man, we got a million dollars. What would we do, right? And we're boring, right? We'd like pay off, pay off the house, put like a bunch in, in college funds for our kids and probably put the rest in like a Roth IRA, right? I mean, whatever. We're not going to have fun. If you're going to inherit $10 million, <laughs> there's no need to, and it would be really silly to go about today walking around boasting about the $10 that you have in your pocket that might be more than somebody else's. Isn't that silly? This, this $10 bill I have and everyone else only has five. In three days, you are going to inherit the world. Meekness is a quiet confidence. It's not boasting. It is it's broken-hearted boldness. Meekness is great courage to correct behavior, to bear witness, and humble courage and confidence. Meekness or gentleness gives us the confidence to have difficult conversations when you see a brother or sister in sin to gently and humbly help them see their ways and pray with them that the Spirit would guide them back to the Lord, right? Again, my own caricature in my mind, I too often have this visual of, I can't believe you would do that. You need to get back to the Lord. You're, you're going to be excommunicated. That is not how Jesus approached people. Do you know the only people he approached like that were? That's right. The Pharisees who were wolves in sheep's clothing, so unless you feel like your brother is a wolf in sheep's clothing, we approach them with humility and gentleness in the Lord. When you begin to have a heart of humility and gentleness, we're going to fly through these next ones now. Right? And we're almost done, right? Because they just domino. These first two are the most important. When you have a heart of humility and gentleness, it gives rise to patience with one another. When other people are elevated above yourself, you have patience with them. Has anybody ever met uh, a president? Ooh, that's fun. Well, it, it could be any president. It doesn't have to be the United States. I mean, from the shows I watch, which are totally accurate, when people are in a meeting or with a room with the president, who decides when that meeting is over? The president. Who decides when it's time for you to leave and the conversation is done? The president. People have patience with the president, don't they? Because he is elevated in stature and standing. And so long-suffering of the heart and patience 
is a natural given. And that is how it should be with our fellow brothers and sisters. That's how it was with Christ and everybody he interacted with. Patience, long-suffering, because they are a higher stature than yourself. Patience is a disposition of the heart. Patience, when it is fully realized, gives rise to enduring love for each other. Patience is also a fruit of the Spirit. It inclines your heart to not seek revenge. Patience is also something you can ask for from the Spirit. Give me patience, Lord, born out of humility and meekness. And then once we've gotten the heart of patience, it leads to enduring love for one another. Humility, gentleness, and patience lead to love. Love is also a fruit of the Spirit. Catching a theme here? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is at the center of being unified in the Spirit, is love. Love for one another. They will know that you are my disciples by your love. Not by your selfishness, not by your pride, not by your ambitions or achievements or your knowledge or your righteousness, but by your love for one another, your true and pure desire to see others prosper and thrive even at the expense of yourself. That is unity of the Spirit. Patience and enduring love lead to maintaining unity in the Spirit. (laughs) Unity is not something that we create. Isn't that a wild thought? Unity is something that the Spirit brings the moment that you believe in Christ Jesus. He brings you into the fold and the family of God, into the unity that He created long ago. We maintain what the Spirit has created. Through life in the Spirit, through life in the Spirit is unity created, and we are called to maintain it in the bond of peace. Peace, also a fruit of the Spirit, is the natural progression of these five characteristics lining up or building on top of each other. Humility and gentleness leading to patience, which gives birth to love. And that love guides us to maintain the unity that the Spirit has created, which gives us the bond of peace. Peace, another way to say it, is the absence of conflict. Now, don't confuse conflict and disagreement, right? See, disagreement is healthy for a community to thrive, grow, and push each other. Disagreements are okay, (laughs) How many times in Scripture do we see disagreements that were, that, were all, that were all right? Disagreement is just us being who God created us to be, different and unique. Conflicts arise when pride is thrown into the mix. When our pride gets in the way of what is best for the body, conflicts are created. And conflicts with fellow believers is disunity, which ties back to why humility is listed first in these characteristics and why it's so close to the heart of Christ. There is no place for pride in the body of God. It will weaken, destroy, and tear apart any community. And above all, it is a dishonor to the name and person of Jesus Christ who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm going to wrap up here read for you again the thrust of this passage. To walk a worthy life, we should have lowliness, meekness, patience, love, unity, and peace. These six things are the framework to a healthy, God-honoring community worthy to be called the Bride of Christ. And they are laid on the foundation of Christ himself. 
A couple of talkback questions for you. I encourage you to write down as you're moving throughout your day at some point. Bring these up with your family or somebody in your life. How do you view others? Think about the last week. How many conversations did you have where you intentionally wanted it to be about the other person? How can you seek that out this week? How can you practice elevating other people in your eyes? Number two, what are you doing to help grow the community of Redeemer? What will you say or do moving forward that will bring humility, that will bring gentleness, that will bring patience and love, unity and peace to this community? I'm going to close with a little bit of my testimony. I don't know if you know this or not, if I've shared this. Um, Grew up in a very Christian town. We were the buckle of the Bible belt, little Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Bury, if you're going to rob a house, you did it on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, because everybody's at church. Right. And I grew up, and I found Christ at the age of 13, and I followed him and loved him in high school, and I went to youth group with these guys who I saw on Wednesday nights. So one of, some of them were in the little praise band and loving the Lord, being leaders in that. I would go on soccer trips with them, and I'd be in drama with them, right? On the choir, and I would see two very different people which is hypocrisy. They, they were not representing or living for the Jesus that I did. So when I went to college, I still loved the Lord and didn't have a crisis of faith, but I quit going to church because all I would do while I was at church was look around and judge people. Right? People I didn't even know. You're not following Christ the way I am. You've got some unrepentant sin in your life. What I wanted was for those people out of the church. Because I didn't want the world to see that and be misled towards Jesus. And one of my first mentors in my life was Mike Harrison. I was a young life life leader. Anybody young life? Ah, ah, a couple people. Young life is a ministry for high school students run by college students to reach the unreached, right? It is the youth group for non-believing high school students who are into drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. So my young life leader over me was working on me for a while on this. And I remember after club, we'd go to Wendy's uh, with the kids, and they would leave one by one. And this particular night, it was just Mike and I left, eating some cold fries and a Coke. And he's, I, I can picture this in my mind's eye, right? This moment of change. Where the spirit started melting my heart. And Mike read to me a passage from Luke 5, which is where Jesus is eating with sinners and tax collectors. And the Pharisees would walk up to his disciples and say, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Isn't that a great word? I love that translation. That is how the Pharisees saw those people. And Jesus heard. He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor. I did not come to heal those who were sick, but those who need a Savior. And Mike looked at me and he said, Andrew, all these people that you want out of the church to have your little community of one, where are they supposed to go? Not to mention that you're wrong on lots of fronts for judging and thinking that of people. But even even if the church is full of broken people, which it is, where are they supposed to go? Is that not what the church is for, of Christ? For broken, lost sinners. And that is what we are. We are a community of broken and lost sinners who are in need of a great Savior. And he has called us to live in community with each other. Humility, gentleness, patience, love, unity, and peace. Let us be challenged on those things. Think about how we can push forward as Redeemer, as we bring in an interim pastor sometime, as we bring in our new pastor. How can we prepare the way now to becoming the worthy bride of Christ that he calls us to be. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this message. For my own heart, I, I find myself so challenged when I'm digging in 
descriptor like this when I <laughs> look at all these things that you want me to say in this message that I don't feel like I do myself. <laughs> that first conversation with Chris Lord is way more often how I treat people. I'm waiting for my turn to talk, to tell them about my life and my problem, Lord. And that is pride. Lord, I pray that we are a church that when people think of Redeemer, they think of humility, humble people with the hearts of Christ that love each other in unity and peace. It's in your name we pray, Father. Amen. We're going to take uh, communion here, which is the perfect way to establish this. Being at the Lord's table in response to this message. Together as we come and share remembering the blood and the body and the sacrifice of Christ. <laughs> we haven't addressed this yet, but if this is your first Sunday at Redeemer, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And we believe in believer's communion. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and claim his name, and follow him. We would love for you to take communion with us. If you are here and you don't believe that, if you've gone to Redeemer for a while and you have not made a decision about Christ, it's okay to stay in your seat. These, these elements don't mean anything to you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke the bread and gave thanks. This is the body that he's going to sacrifice and the blood that he's going to shed for us. I'm going to pray. I'll sum up and play some music for us and I want you to come up and receive the elements and invite the ushers up to serve that at this time. Let me pray. Lord, I pray for communion, specifically, Father, as the response to what you have done, the work you have done, and who you call us to be in this bond of unity and peace that we would take communion today fully aware of all the believers around us who are taking it with us, Lord. That we are as one mind and one body through one Lord and one faith, remembering who you are and what you did. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you this time to come grab the cup, the bread and the juice, and then go sit back down and we'll take it together.